Welcome to today's panel on uh, Untold Stories, Disability and Inclusion Within Literature and Publishing. I'm Claire Wade. I'm a white woman with dark blonde hair wearing a red jumper. I'm the author of The Choice, uh, winner of the Good Housekeeping First Novel Competition and the East Anglian Book Award for Fiction. I'm the founder of Authors with Disabilities and Chronic Illnesses, also known as ADCI. Historically, disabled people have been silenced, their stories ignored or told by non-disabled writers. Disabled creators are now fighting to be seen and heard, working to gain visibility on bookshelves and literary stages. Today, I'm joined by award-winning author Penny Parks, poet and founder of Cryptic Arts, Jamie Hale, and Penny Batchelor, author and founder of Keep Festivals Hybrid. We're here to discuss why literature needs to be more accessible and inclusive. This session will last 45 minutes. It's virtual, which means we have people watching in Cheltenham and online. To ensure accessibility, we have a BSL interpreter, Holly Harwood, and Zoom captions are also enabled. The panelists will now tell you a little bit more about themselves. First, we have Penny Parks or Penny P. Hi, I'm Penny Parks. I'm 48. I'm white with curly hair. Uh, I'm wearing a soft green dress and I'm talking to you from my home in the Cotswolds. Um, I've lived for decades, really, with a with a disabling alphabet soup of autonomic and autoimmune um, diseases, um, which are, for the most part, invisible and also dynamic, uh, something which we're probably going to come back and talk a little bit more about later on. I've also published six books. Um, I've topped the Audible chart, the Kindle chart. I've won the Award for Romantic Comedy of the Year uh, with my debut novel, which was the first in the Out of Practice series. Uh, and my latest two novels, Maybe Tomorrow and Home, have a slightly more sort of book club feel, uh, which gave me, um, well, the chance to delve a little bit deeper into the sort of light and dark of contemporary life and explore some characters that I think will maybe resonate a little bit more within today's conversation. Um, I'm delighted to be here today remotely because otherwise I wouldn't be able to talk to you. I'm very much uh, a remote author these days and please forgive me if I glance at my notes from time to time. Uh, there's an awful lot to talk about. Um, we're somewhere between the estimate now is 24 and 30 percent of the UK population um, uh, basically disabled or living with chronic illnesses. Um, I don't think there has ever been a more relevant time to talk about what we're discussing today, um, and certainly how many of them um, enjoy books, enjoy reading, enjoy living um, through the pages of, of our work. And I am incredibly grateful to Cheltenham Festivals for, for hosting this event and giving us this opportunity. Thanks, Penny. Now, Jamie. Hi, um, I'm Jamie Hale. I'm a white genderqueer person with dark red hair and a beard. Uh, my wheelchair headrest is round my head and I'm wearing a black floral t-shirt. My background is blurred. Um, I'm cross-disciplinary creative and writer, um, including a poetry pamphlet, Shield. I founded award-winning Cryptic Arts and the Disabled Poets Prize. And I've also carried out research into the experiences of disabled people in literature, titled Access to Literature. Um, as someone who is disabled. Um, I'm a full-time electric wheelchair user with a progressive physical condition. And this has really shaped my commitment to accessible literature opportunities and to recognizing the value that disabled people bring to the industry in terms of authenticity, experience, and more. And thank you for having me. Well, thank you. And finally, Penny Batchelor or Penny B for today. Yes, uh, Penny B today. It's uh, not very often I'm with another Penny. I was always the only Penny in my class at school, uh, which was a long time ago. I'm um, a woman, white woman in my 40s. I have a dark blonde bob and I'm wearing a pink and red striped jumper. Um, I am the Amazon best-selling author of two psychological thrillers. Um, her perfect sister sorry my perfect sister and her new best friend and I'm published by Embla and I have another book hopefully coming out in June next year 
I am the co-founder of the ADCI Literary Prize, which is aimed to celebrate disabled authors who write adult fiction, which have one or more disabled characters. And we also want to really promote representation in fiction for disabled people in general, and that books don't have to be about disability. Our character, we should just be there as, as because we're all part of a modern day society. Um, I'm also a freelance journalist. Um, recently had a piece commissioned by the Women's Prize for Fiction, which is on their website. And I'm a regular columnist on disability issues and publishing for the bookseller. Lovely. Thank you so much. We've got a fantastic panel. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say today. First, let's understand why disability inclusion is important. What do you think disabled authors and poets bring to literature? Penny Parks. Well, for me anyway, when it comes to um, fiction, I think the pivotal point for every novel, and I probably am going to be talking more about fiction than nonfiction, um, it's just relatable and nuanced characters. So whether that comes from incredible research, whether that comes from uh, sensitivity reads, or whether it's lived experience, um, I mean, that's arguable, but I do know the books that I have personally adored and the messages that I get back from readers who are amazing at keeping in touch. And, and it's an absolute joy. But they all tend to focus when we're talking about health and disability issues on the same thing. It's on feeling seen. It's on feeling heard. And it's having that resonance within the plot line or the characterization that touches them and relates to them personally, because and this is only my opinion, I, I think that's the way a book becomes a slow burn bestseller. I mean, obviously there's TikTok and all these things that I probably don't understand the way I should, but um, there is a massive, a massive community of readers, book bloggers, um, even, you know, obviously staff within um, the publishing industry who identify as disabled or have chronic health issues and have to adapt. And I think possibly, sadly, with recent events, a growing number. So what we need to do is, is not just address those um, lived experiences um, as a sort of, a, you know, a, a genre in itself. Um, but as readily and truthfully and without filters as, as we would anything else, because I think the more we filter it or the more we try to pigeonhole it, um, we leave fiction generally all the, the poorer for it. But let's be frank, it's a really hard line to walk. Um, and it's not it's well, it's basically because we're not talking about education here. We're talking about a different way of living um, lives that are still rich and fulfilling and very much part of our society. And, and I mean, I feel that they should be sort of proudly portrayed within our literature rather than sort of pigeonholed to one side. Um, and also, it's my quiet bugbear, never really used as a shortcut to characterization. Um, so who better? I mean, who better to write those stories than than the people who have those lived experiences? Thank you. Jamie. I think every author brings something of themselves to the work that they write and that that is so informed by their own experience that when we don't have disabled writers, then there is something missing throughout the industry. And that's not just in how we write about disability, but perhaps in how the ways in which disabled people move through the world and how that informs our writing far beyond any sort of even connected content. And then when there are no disabled writers and when there are no authentic stories about disability, it creates a void in the market. And that void becomes filled by other people writing disabled characters and writing about disability. And of course, they don't have a wealth of literature with disabled characters written by disabled authors to draw on. So slowly we develop more and more tropes and more and more caricatured ideas of what it is to be disabled because the stories that we hear about disabled people become increasingly reinforced by those cultural narratives and divorced from our actual experiences. And I think what we bring is the ability to really revitalize how one can write a disabled character or how a piece can be informed by disability in the work that we create that will then inform and shape the work by other writers, both disabled and not. Yeah, that's really important. Penny B. 
Well, in my opinion, I think disabled authors and poets bring fantastic stories and are a different viewpoint to literature and fiction. So I'm talking about fiction and and, and not uh, non-fiction now. It's all about taking the reader to different places, lives, experiences that they haven't had. And some of the best books that you read can really show you something that you've never even thought about or um, experienced yourself. And if disabled people are missing from that narrative, well, as Penny P said, we're between 20 and 30 percent of the population and that is weird if we're not there there's been a fantastic push in the industry although we could still do more for representing for example people of color uh black and asian experiences um queer experiences and what have you but i do feel that disabled experiences are are lacking and we need, as Jamie said, we need more disabled writers to actually tell us what it's like and not fall into those awful tropes of triumph over tragedy or misery memoirs or that um, you have to prove something if you're disabled to prove that you're as good as anybody else because we jolly well are. Yeah. So from the sounds of it, you don't think that this is just for disabled writers this isn't on disabled readers penny parts no. Is... <laughs> no i mean ab absolutely no i mean um we are we are creators pure and simple um and our skill with words and our word building is is it's all encompassing but it could also be illuminating mm -hmm. um and often i would actually argue that having a, a slightly more challenging set of personal circumstances gives us a bigger repertoire to draw on when we're shaping our characters and our worlds and and maybe sort of touching levels that someone who maybe has a, a slightly more straightforward setup it probably wouldn't even occur to them I hear very often oh my god I would never even have thought of that and whether that's talking about characterization or organization um it's just something I hear a lot and and so that's my goal that's my little kind of personal goal is to try and stop that but when it comes to creating my my books um I take enormous pride in working on the balance because I don't believe that anybody, any reader, disabled, abled, otherwise, wants to pick up a book and feel preached to, or, or actually educated. I, I think they want to be transported. It's that willing suspension of disbelief. It's it's that word build, world building again. Um, I mean, we can still be funny. I mean, mine's quite an edgy, dark kind of humor at times, but I think we all have to live with that sometimes. We fall in love, we work, we raise families. Um, and whilst disability might dictate how we live our own everyday lives, um, it doesn't have to be our defining characteristic or pivotal to everything we do in the same way that books featuring disability um, that have moved me the most have often had the lightest, the lightest of touches. It hasn't been the main meal. It's been the seasoning that brings out the flavor. Mm. And, and I just think that's so important because when it comes to how a book is marketed or promoted, I, I think it's the emphasis that's crucial. Yes. Um, and I think readers might be missing out on some truly amazing works of art if they're billed solely as revolving around chronic illness or disabled, uh, uh, you know, lives rather than the layered and unique voice that you're getting, you know, possibly for 99p on Kindle. Um, and actually, I kind of wanted to touch on that because I love to hold a paperback. I can drop it in the bath, no drama. But Kindle, with its sort of font accessibility and Audible, um, they've opened up the world of books in a way that we could never have foreseen 10 years ago, because books really are for everyone. And it's a huge privilege to be able to share our stories through those mediums that reach readers who otherwise would miss out. And I know this because they write and they tell me. Um, and I know this increasingly because it, it's actually how I'm starting to consume content myself. Jamie. I think with an increasing industry focus on the importance of diversity, we end up sometimes in a place where works by disabled writers are pigeonholed as being disability rather than being anything more general. And 
that means that we're only really being asked to speak to disabled people or to speak about disability rather than being given the space to tell universal stories and disability and the experience of being disabled gives a specific lens to a universal story but I think when it's when our work is being built and marketed and discussed as being very heavily disability centered that creates a situation in which it's not opened up to wider audiences and wider audiences feel like they can't get anything from it one of the things I well, the thing I love about writing is the way in which it opens doors to other worlds, whatever genre you're in, to other understandings, and that in doing that, it can and should speak to everyone. And so for me as a disabled reader, while I am interested in work by disabled writers, I'm almost interested in, more interested in work by writers where I don't have that shared lived experience because I want to be opened up to those universal doors and stories. And I think that's what we need to be pushing the industry to encourage rather than to treat it as a tick box exercise with the disability list. Yeah, it's really important. Penny B. Well, um, following on from what uh, Jamie said, I totally agree that um, we don't want to be pigeonholed as just for disabled people. Our work just for them. And I, I, so I would urge any publishers and agents looking please don't uh, fall into the trap of thinking oh well there's just a small disability market that other people won't want to read it because if a book is well written of course they will um we're part of society and our stories are for all i read books um by authors that i have no experience of their culture or what have you and it opens the world opens my eyes um it's brilliant um and I would just like to say that in my psychological thrillers I include disabled and chronically ill characters because we are part of the modern day landscape uh, but my books aren't specifically about disability we're just there and the characters are flawed and human their colleagues their friends their neighbors just as in everyday life and the last point that I would like to make um, on this question is that whilst I completely champion disabled authors, I don't think that people who are non-disabled should never write disabled characters. I want you to be our allies, but would say, do your research, talk to us first, and avoid all those awful stereotypes that I mentioned earlier on. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, I think you've uh, successfully covered both the, that question and my next one. So I'm going to skip over to the uh, one after that. What are some of the obstacles you've faced as a disabled author or poet? Penny Parks. Well, I, th I think, Rick, just cards on the table. I think there is a, a truly pervasive fear throughout the arts that if you are perceived as a creator who is in any way in need of extra accommodations um, or expensive, or perhaps requires that little bit of extra thought, um, that there will always, always be plenty of other authors and creators ready and willing to step into your shoes. Um, and that fear is everything really, because it's the moment you, you kind of have to be brave and say, I need to do this event remotely, or I need an overnight before and after the event, or I can't travel and do the event on the same day, or even as a, a recent example that, that I've been, my ongoing discussions about accessible fonts, not just. Oh, Penny has um, frozen a bit. I think she, her Wi-Fi and her lovely uh, cottage might be playing oh. up. Oh, she's back again. I'm back. Did you You're lose back. me? Keep going. Keep going. Um, in an ideal world, authors who aren't at that sort of celebrity level would feel okay about asking for what they need, I suppose is what it comes down to. And I know far too many authors who live in a cycle of boom and bust. Um, it's it's behind the scenes. And I, I did it myself for years. Yeah. Thanks, Penny. I think we'll go to Jamie now. So... I guess I kind of see the obstacles I've faced as being both boxed in and boxed out. Being boxed into the idea of being a disabled writer, being the pick for a diversity panel, etc., but not being of interest as a writer. 
and then being boxed out of being able to create about other spaces and other identities and other experiences and being in that universal. Um, I find certainly that there are significant physical barriers, whether we're thinking about the number of events that don't have wheelchair access or have wheelchair access for audiences, but not people who are reading or speaking, whether we're thinking about the costs of bringing the 24 hour one-to-one -one support I need with me, as well as the costs of bringing me up, whether we're thinking about events being entirely in person rather than there being an option of participating remotely. Certainly, there are a huge number of barriers in that area. And my desire to be able to access physical spaces is strong, but I also want there to be virtual spaces. I think sometimes I found that the industry says, oh, you know, the room's not accessible, but you could do it over Zoom. And that's not an answer either, because trying to create opportunities that are actually accessible and overcome these obstacles requires you to be thinking about access, valuing the physical and the virtual equally, and ensuring that the audiences, speakers, etc., in both of those have their needs met and are able to really participate and contribute. And I know that I found that when I actually push and ask for accommodations, generally speaking, people are incredibly supportive and understanding and they're made, but I'm aware that I'm very used to advocating for myself and I worry about the experiences of people who don't feel able to push back at all. It shouldn't be that you have to be willing and able to push back to be able to take part in the industry. Um, and then briefly, that when I did the access to literature research with Spread the Word, focusing on the barriers faced by disabled writers in the industry, key barriers were financial ones that people literally couldn't afford to take part in it. There wasn't enough paid work and many of the opportunities that people wanted to participate in were instead sort of paid to participate. But people also talked a lot about the obstacles of never seeing yourself represented. And that's a big part of it. I don't remember really having read at many events where there's been another electric wheelchair user at the same event also reading. They've got one, they've ticked it off, that's brilliant, done, sorted. And you end up, if you don't see yourself reflected in a space, feeling like you don't belong in a space. And that creates such a strong barrier to being able to push yourself forward and go for opportunities. Because if you're the only one like you, then how how do you do that? Yeah, it, it is. And it's really hard having to ask for what you need and, and worrying about how that's going to jeopardise potentially your career. Um, as being maybe seen as the difficult one which you shouldn't be that's not it's not okay but there is that fear and that was what I you know struggled with when I was publishing my debut Penny B what's your experience of this well following on from what Jamie said about being the only wheelchair wheelchair in the room I'm a wheelchair user and I'm I'm a hearing aid user as well and I can uh, vividly remember going to one uh, very big festival and there were me and another wheelchair user there it was lovely to see him because it's it, it, it's hard being the only one in the room because then the whole onus is on you to ask for uh accessibility information and to point things out and sometimes people you know they, they do their best to try and make it accessible but it isn't because they've not had somebody go and road test it or what have you and um, i've been very fortunate really as a disabled author um when I first started querying I was very concerned that my lack of mobility would count against me because I can't jump on a train and go to London I can't whiz around and do lots of events in one day and what have you but my first publisher Claire Christian who I co-founded the ADCI Literary Prize with very supportive and now I'm with Embla and they are very much as well but one one um one obstacle I did face was that, like you, Claire, I, I first uh, published in lockdown and that was very difficult, but there was a sort of bonus for me that everything went online. So I was able to participate in author groups and festivals and online promotions and things. And that so that became what I expected from the industry. And then when lockdown finished and... A lot of people in the industry said, phew, we can go back to meeting in person. We're going to stop all these online events. It was awful. And from I 
my experience and the ADCI group that, that you founded and uh, people I spoke to for research for articles that I've done, it, it decimated people. It was just so soul destroying that those doors that had been opened were now just slammed straight shut in their face, which is why Claire Christian and I co-founded the Keep Festivals Hybrid campaign. And I would also like to give a shout out here to Julie Farrell and Eva Dundas, who produced the Inclusion Guide. It's inclusion with a K. And anybody who wants to be our ally and wants to know uh, what they should be doing to make um, events and everything more accessible for disabled authors, please go and download that on the internet. And Spread the Word also have a fantastic guide that actually teaches you how to set up a hybrid event um, cheaply, very easily, literally a laptop and uh, and Wi-Fi and away you go. So it doesn't have to be complicated. It's, uh, and it's inclusion. It means that people aren't left out and aren't isolated. And if you can do that for readers, anyone who loves books wants to share that love with other readers. So keep people included. And may I just add to that point, Claire, that... Um... Authors don't earn a lot of money. We need to keep going. We need to sell our books. And to do that, we need promotion. We need to get involved. And uh, that's why it's so important. Which leads on to my uh, next question, which is about how do we get better visibility for disabled authors and disabled stories? What can the publishing industry do? And what can, can readers do as well? Penny Parks. Um. Well, I have a bit of a conflict here because I think the sign that we've made true progress is when a disabled story becomes just that, a story. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a sign of our times when it's fully integrated, it's accepted, it's validated. It's a novel that embraces a life lived differently. And I think actually that really encompasses so many genres within the publishing industry full stop. Uh, for me, the win would be a shift in, in the attitude or the perception um, it's it's a willingness, I think, really, by commissioning editors, booksellers, readers, evening. Uh, it's just to be prepared to feel a little bit uncomfortable just for a minute. Um, and then to appreciate that between those pages is an insightful, vibrant story with relatable characters that still resonate long after the, the final page. Because if we ask for a category, well, then, then where do we fit? Because when it comes to invisible disabilities or dynamic disabilities, where one day you're functional, the next day you're in a flare. Um, and even on the days I, I am in a flare, I get that dreaded line, oh, but you look okay, come on, you, you can do it. Um, so, and, and I get that from, from friends as, as well as colleagues, so, so don't feel bad. But I mean, I do, I do genuinely wonder if I turned up here today in my in my lovely pajamas um you know with an oxygen mask would my voice still be heard and you know would my opinion about any of this carry the same weight so it doesn't really seem how many books or awards or chart toppers are sort of stacked on the shelves behind me I think it's another uncomfortable truth and until we start addressing those uncomfortable truths I don't really think that anything's going to change and that tide has to turn um, so that creators, and I mean, some of the very, very best talent in the world, look at the publishing industry and see it as a valid career choice and look at writing and think I can make a living from that. Um, and at the moment, I think we're all missing out slightly as a consequence of that not necessarily always being the case. Um, it's crossing that that sort of boundary of 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 momentary discomfort of of admitting look i don't know i don't understand i don't live with it but i'd like to learn um and and actually being willing and open and just because i sort of scooched out of the other question the biggest thing for me the biggest thing is offer um for particularly for debut authors i think if somebody offers you a situation it is so much easier to accept than to have to be brave and ask um we're not all sort of you know big big names that can kind of come in with a rider and arm long. I, I just think if you're if you're new, if you're nervous, if you're feeling vulnerable and that vulnerability feels so, so much bigger than it probably is, um, having to ask for those accommodations can feel enormous and off-putting. So I think people don't ask. Um, and that's where I'd like to see the, the, the tide turn a little bit. But in terms of better visibility, 
oh, a meeting with a marketing person and a PR person and, and sitting down and saying, you know, yes, this is my life, but let's talk about my work. Yes. Um, and let's see how we can bring it to the to the people who deserve to read it and see it and would then be brave enough to put their own manuscripts in that, you know, envelope and send it off because God knows that's scary anyway. So brilliant. Thank you, Jamie. I think Penny P touched on a really important point there around the idea of normalising, particularly in fiction, the idea that the default character could be a disabled character rather than the default character being a non-disabled character. But I think beyond that, thinking about getting better visibility, this requires sustained industry investment in kind of supporting works and writers. And I've seen that in the bookseller particularly, which has really increased focus on the coverage of work by disabled writers enormously. And that's brought people to far higher prominence. Um, one of the things that we founded at Cryptic Arts was the Disabled Poets Prize. And that was about capturing work by new and established poets and really giving it that boost, that publicity, that push forward, as well as being able to give writers a financial award. And I think the wider industry needs to commit to things, to, to projects like this that really focus on raising the profile of work by disabled writers so that the so that other aspects of the industry really have to pay attention to it and so that it can't be kind of ignored, sidelined and marginalised. But I also think that we need to be careful as we do this and that if we are currently, as I hope we are, focusing on how we open up the literature sector to more diverse disabled stories, how do we make sure that we're not reflecting the overwhelming whiteness of the literature industry in the opportunities we create and the people we bring forward and the events and the work and all of the things that we push through and thinking about making sure that we're recognizing the different barriers that different people face to these opportunities and that just as we feel unseen and unrepresented in an industry that doesn't reflect us and our body minds and our experiences how do we make sure that we don't end up reinforcing that in other elements of the industry in the work that we do yeah, very, very important. Thank you. Penny B. Well, um, I think this we need to expand this question out into the industry. We need allies. Uh, disabled writers, we can make you a lot of money, which is what uh, what the publishing industry, industry wants, isn't it? That we need your support in marketing budgets, um, online events and what have you. And... We need more disabled people getting high up in uh, publishing companies. They have their lived experience, so they're not going to feel, as Penny P said, uncomfortable about maybe commissioning some things. They don't quite understand it or they think people aren't going to want to read it because disability is a bit icky and um, isn't everybody just miserable anyway or that sort of thing. Um, and, and we need booksellers and bookshops to promote our books and to really spread the word but I would also add a, a comment here that please just don't pigeonhole disabled writers as just writing about disability we can write about anything that we want and I because I'm a disability campaigner and I'm campaigning for uh, better treatment and awareness of disabled authors in the industry yeah I do talk about this subject a lot but I'm also a crime writer so I want to be invited to go on panels to talk about plotting and uh, frenemies and uh, cliffhangers red herrings and and what have you and the state of the crime fiction market too so don't don't uh just stick us in a box thank yeah. you Brilliant. well we have almost run out of time so very very quickly what's one thing that you think the literary world could do to encourage and support disabled authors and poets? Penny Parks. Well, I think in, in realistically, um, 
being made to feel welcome in your own profession is enormous. Having a, an open-minded and willing team, whether that's agents, publishers, booksellers, organizers, it really makes the difference between sort of enduring the process and having a, a, a sort of an enjoyable career and success. But I think the really, really crucial thing is that so many of the adjustments and accommodations that would mean the world to us cost nothing. Mm. They cost publishers nothing they cost event organizers nothing um but they, they they are literally everything in terms of changing the course of a career or as we've discovered sort of a third of the population's career um and i know so many um amazing suggestions have been made here today but i think the biggest shift just has to begin with a mindset around what disabled creators can bring to the table and to the industry um, and to be seen as an asset, if you like, rather than a liability or worse still, that sort of tokenism that you see occasionally. Um, so events like today, they are everything. Brilliant. Thank you. Jamie? I would say supporting and funding things like prizes and opportunities that really work to bring work by disabled writers to greater prominence and to boost the careers of those writers and their work, which will increase representation, increase the chance that people see themselves seen and broaden the diversity of stories, both that are written and told and that readers find out about. Because it's no good publishing work by disabled writers if you don't also do something to make sure that the readers find out that work exists. Perfect. And finally, Penny B. I would say, please uh, be our ally. When you have a new author, ask everybody if they have any access needs. Um, so it, there's not the onus on us to have to go to tell you. And also a little bit of an elephant in the room, but please pay us fairly. Don't expect us to do things for free. We can't keep going um, as writers if we can't make a living. And that's really important. Not everybody has a trust fund or is a celebrity or has a rich partner. Perfect. Thank you. I'd like to say a big thank you to Penny Parks, Jamie Hale and uh, Penny Batchelor for today. Um, thank you also to our interpreter Holly Harwood and to Andrew Lansley and Cheltenham Literature Festival for organising this event. The uh, recording will be available shortly and you can purchase our books if you are on site today and there should be a table set up by the side of the stage. Um, and I think uh, Penny Parks' has, has books are signed. Um, and if you want uh, books signed by um, some of uh, us on the panel, then uh, get in touch with us on Twitter um, or X or social media, you'll find us. Um, and um, there's also, if you're online and you would like to get our books, um, you can go to the link bit.ly forward slash untold 2023. Um, and you can find all of us uh, there. And finally, big thank you to everyone on the panel, to all of you watching either in Cheltenham or at home. And uh, let's com continue this conversation online. The festival hashtag is CheltlitFest and our hashtag is hashtag ADCI. Thank you. <laughs>